Hello and welcome, welcome to everyone joining us online and in person for this final event of HistFest 2024. I'm so thrilled that we have Brian Cox here to talk about history on stage and screen with Clive Myrie. I'm going to introduce the two speakers now. I'm, I'm keeping this quick because we're sticking to a tight hour this evening. So Brian Cox is an Emmy, Olivier and Golden Globe winning actor, best known for the HBO hit series Succession, for which he won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Drama Series. He's also the recipient of of a Primetime Emmy Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Limited Series for his portrayal of Hermann Goering in Nuremberg, and has, and, sorry, and has a formidable movie career with films such as The Long Kiss Goodnight, The Escapist, Coralanus, Coralanus, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, and Manhunter, Churchill, and The Bourne Trilogy, Troy, Braveheart, and others, to name just a few. He's also a veteran of the London stage, having won two Olivier Awards for Best Actor for his performances in Titus. Andronicus for the Royal Shakespeare Company and Rat in a Skull for the Royal Court. He's currently appearing in the critically acclaimed production of Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey in Tonight at Wyndham Theatre, London. So we're it's especially grateful for him um, giving up his Sunday to do this. He's also the author of three books, Salem to Moscow, An Actor's Odyssey, The Lear Diaries, and his autobiography, Putting the Rabbit in the Hat. Among his many honours, he's the recipient of the BAFTA Scotland Award for Outstanding Achievement, um, and the 2004 Great Scott Awards, he won the Lifetime Achievement Award as well. In 2003, he was made a CBE um, uh, yes, he was made a CB. I think <laughs> so, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we love you, Brian. Well, that's fine. <laughs> okay, I will end. I will end. Um, but chairing the event this evening is Clive Murray, who's a multi award winning broadcaster. Don't and go through every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I will halt. But he also presents Mastermind, um, BBC, he's BBC's chief news correspondent, and this is the most important part. In 2023, he released his critically acclaimed and Sunday Times best-selling memoir, Everything is Everything, a memoir of love, hate, and hope. I will hand over to the staff. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for that. Very good afternoon, everyone, and to you, Brian, um, an actor I've admired for many, many years. Um, and a man who at birth almost became Colin yes. Cox. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, your father, Charles, he went to register you as Colin. The registrar said, I don't like that name. <laughs> and what did your dad say? He said, I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> but he was sent on a mission to call me Colin. Um, but everybody said, it was at a time when they the finally had radio cars, police and radio cars. Yeah. So it's, and the, the, guy, um, the guy actually said, the register said, yeah, but you know what it's like? Because they all knew one another. They said, you know what it's like, Chick? And my father's called Chick. So you know what it's like, Chick? Calling all cars, calling all cars. <laughs> so it'll be an impossible name to live with. Oh, and, and my, my father said, I thought that as well. I thought the very same thing. <laughs> so when he went back to see my mother, my, he said, says, so have you registered Colin? And uh, my dad said, uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, but I have registered Brian. And there was a long pause. And my mother said, oh, well. I'll live with that, <laughs> and that was it. And that, and was, that it. was that was it. Well, that that twist of history of past circumstance, um, it informs the present. You are Brian, um, and there was probably never any chance of you calling any of your sons Colin. No, <laughs> no, 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 no chance at all. Okay, so I'm interested uh, in how you go about exploring the past um, and exploring history in your work with the famous characters you portrayed, real figures like Churchill, Hermann Goering in the TV drama Nuremberg, for which you won an Emmy. Um, how much of your construction of a character uh, is based in the history we all know about these people? And how much springs from your imagination? Well, there's a sort of combination of both. <laughs> I think historically you've got to be accurate. And I think you've got to face them for, I mean, it's very interesting you know, having played Churchill. Now, Churchill in my hometown was deeply unpopular because he was the MP <laughs> of Dundee from, 2000, from 1908 to 1922. And he hated Dundee. He actually, he actually <laughs> when he left the city, he made a curse after my, and this was after my uncle, um, my uncle Jordy poured a whole bucket of water on top of him from a ceiling <laughs> while he was giving a speech. So he wasn't particularly pleased with Dundee. Uh, 
but you had, and then you understand why did the Dundee people hate him? Because they had him for a long time, and the reason ultimately was because of his how he because of the there was a big Irish community, and it was how he treated Ireland and how he was directly or indirectly responsible for the death of Michael Collins. Right. You know, and uh, so you you begin to piece bits together historically, and it's always got to do with you know any any role you prepare, and that's the great gift, that's the gift to an actor, is when they, they have to look into the history of whatever character they're playing. And of course, it yields so much, you know. I, 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 the best time is to play, I mean, like, uh, I, I found it fascinating to, to play um, Goring. Because Goring was regarded as a rather nasty piece of work, not a very pleasant man. But, but he, when you when you examine Goring's life, you realise he was a man who was this after von Richthofen was the second uh, Ares in in Germany. He took his squadron in, at the end of the war. He was so disgusted, and by the Treaty of Versailles, and he took his whole squadron and threw them into Switzerland mm. and abandoned the planes there and then walked back and he kept on going and he ended up living in Switzerland for a number of years and had a nervous breakdown as a result. And then this young Viennese painter um, who he kind of heard about suddenly became, he was watching, he was following all the reports and then he went back to Germany to, to help this young man called Adolf Hitler and the rest is history. And it's very interesting when you get into the things like the final solution, mm. things like the concentration camps. Now, he did indeed start the concentration camps, but they were about concentrating. They weren't, they weren't uh, about slaughter. They weren't about what happened, and what, you know. And he was not part of that final solution. They, they kept him out of it. Heydrich and people like that were, but not go. So you, you really begin to identify what the cat, and he was, a fascinating Mike. He was a cross-dresser as well. Uh, he had the most ridiculous marriage when he was in, kind of very overweight and in his 40s to an equally overweight well, wife. And it was quite funny because they, they did it with horses with plumes and then these two rather large figures get out and they go off. So all of that adds to the texture of what you're doing. Right. I mean, Hilary Mantel, uh, when she was talking about writing historical fiction, she said she tries to find the dramatic shape in real events. Yeah. The real events of Cromwell's life, uh, we all may already know from our history books. So how do you shape those events that we all know about to into something that's new and interesting that's going to make us want to come to the cinema or theater or whatever to see you well i mean a lot of it role. of course depends on the writer uh yeah. the writer of the, the the script uh interestingly enough i played cromwell uh in a in a it's, it's, i think it's robert bolt's version of the man, oh, man for all seasons man for all seasons yeah. yeah and i i did that and i remember Find you know because he's painted as a rather shadowy and you know a little bit he's a tiny bit two dimensional, and then you begin to understand who he was and you know his ambition, mm -hmm. and that he was a plodder in many many ways, and then you see this machinating force at work and how he how he maneuvered himself through and how he kept himself going until he was finally twigged and he ended up getting the chop, so that. Again, that's the journey that you take on. So that you try and give it life, but you also adhere to what his history is. Mm. And it's the history that's the, it's the clue to where you direct the character. You know, and it's, just, it's just a fascinating process. And uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I love that process. It's, what's, it's the gift that you get. When you play somebody historical, it gives you a gift because you begin to find out who that person was. And everybody has their own point of view. I mean, even the bad guys have their own point of view, you know. And if you look at Germany, and particularly the rise of Nazism, and you look at the Treaty of Versailles, and you see how brutal the Treaty of Versailles was in relationship to the German people, and how it was a very bad, very bad treaty, because it was actually, it was out of the Treaty of Versailles that, a, a character like Hitler grew up. Yeah. Right. Do you bring your own mythology to it? I, what, what how, how much? Well, how much of? <laughs> I was going to say how much of Goering is you. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, would, yeah. that would that wouldn't be right. That no, wouldn't no, be right. No, no, I mean, but, but no. But much, it's a fair, fair question. Yeah. I, I mean, you you you've got to you've got to examine the 
in interior mechanism of a man, uh, if you're playing somebody, you've got to understand what motivates him and what his drawbacks are, what his weaknesses is. For instance, in Nuremberg, of course, we never did it in the TV show, uh, Robert Jackson, who was the main prosecutor, who wasn't even a proper, he was given that job. And Goering ran circles round room because he, he, he historically said, you don't, un he, and Jackson hadn't understood what, why Germany became the way Germany became. And he gave a huge lecture for days on National Socialism. Why did something, why did National Socialism arise? Even whether you agree with it or not, you know, and I don't agree with it, but it's interesting why that happens. So you're looking for the why all the time. Why does somebody pursue that line as opposed to that line? Why does it go, why does history go in that way instead of the way a much more positive and much more embracing way than it goes. And, and you realize that, you know, uh, it's, it's the human fault, really, you know. Is there a danger that you can get the balance wrong between the history and Hilary Mantel talking about finding the drama in the facts uh, and your imagination being involved? Some have suggested, for instance, that um, uh, Ridley Scott's uh, Napoleon Terrible. plays... <laughs> terrible. It's, truly, it's too fast it's, and loose with the facts. No, it's too. Well, it's, it's a truly terrible performance by Joaquin Phoenix. <laughs> I mean, he's appalling. I mean, it really is appalling. He's got no bearing on it. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what he was thinking about. But is that his fault or is that Scott's fault? I think fault? it's totally his fault. <laughs> and I don't think Ridley Scott helps him because uh, Ridley was just, he loved the battles and all of that. But, you know, it's a horrible movie. So if this had been you, if Ridley Scott had said, you know, you're playing Napoleon X, Y, Z, blah, blah, well, blah, blah, I, blah, a lot, said... I would have played it a lot better than... than right. Martin, Martin Phillips, I'll tell you that much. You would have said, I'm sorry, this is historically inaccurate. Yeah, I would have. I was not... Napoleon was not at the execution of Marie Antoinette, no. X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. You'd have said all of that. I would have done all that. I would have said, well, why are you doing that? And he would say, oh, it's good drama. He said, no, it's lies. You know, you, 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 can, you can give... You've got to be careful. There is a certain responsibility in presenting people. You can't whitewash them. That's not on. But also, you've got to tell the truth. You've got to tell the truth of how their lives were led. And, you know, he wasn't at the execution of Marie Antoinette. And, and, and he was very responsible. He was, you know, and he wasn't a nutcase. You know, he was a very smart Corsican. He knew what he was doing. And he was a very clever man. But... Uh, Whacking, I think it's well-named Wacky, Whacking. <laughs> it's a sort of wacky performance. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. I'm enough just... of that. <laughs> it, it, enough of that. I mean, it, well, OK. You can go too far in trying to find the drama in the historical facts. Mm -hmm. But as long as you capture the essence of the character, the truth of the character, yeah. does everything else around it matter? Can it, you get away with... Well, yeah, you... but, it, but the truth's the truth. You know, you, 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 you can't obfuscate that. You either tell the truth or you don't. Uh, and that's the... Resp I mean, when you're dealing with... I mean, like, for instance, in, in the Churchill film that I did, uh, there was this great question, which I looked into very, very carefully, which was Churchill didn't want a repeat of Gallipoli. Mm. So he was very resistant to the idea of D-Day. Mm. Uh, he came round to it. And in fact, he suggested at one point that him and the king, when they did arrive, that they should arrive together in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Normandy, that the king should come on a boat. And everybody thought that was a terrible idea, and they nixed that. But the interesting thing about him was that he was concerned, and, and on, Alan Brooke talks about his concern, Eisenhower talks about his concern. So there was, and people said, oh, well, he never had any problem, but he had a huge problem about it. Also, he was a man who just suffered a major heart attack. He was also 70. So there's a lot of contributing factors to those decisions about who you are, where you are, what kind of state you're in and how he finally came round to the notion of D-Day, and of course D-Day was a success. But then Gallipoli, Gallipoli had been a complete personal disaster for him, and it was the same premise, which was uh, an invasion from the sea, 
which went horribly wrong in the Gallipoli Guard. But it was now the, it was the opposite. But he was very, very nervous about, about that situation. So that was what our film sort of focused on. And I thought that was a really interesting notion. And it, and it was a revealing notion, because it's something we never thought about Churchill, you know, because, he's, he, because of his positiveness throughout the war, you know, because he was a great... He was a great war leader, even though most of the work was done by Attlee, as far as the running of the country was concerned. Yeah. But, you know, so that, those kind of elements are very, very important to acknowledge and see and actually have courage about, you know. When you're trying to um, represent, I suppose, on screen or on the stage, a historical character, do you, do you walk around in, you know, smoking a cigar for six months Oh, no, that's before? all bollocks. No, <laughs> <laughs> Why did I think I would get that response? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, uh, you know, acting is, you know, actors are, tr you know, the, the, there's a, we have this whole thing about, you know, what America has done to drama and actors and how you behave and how, and, uh, and it was a thing that happened in the 50s, you know, with uh, Lee Strasberg, and it's, it's a kind of nonsense, you know. We're transmitters. That's what we are as actors. We transmit energy, and we, but we deal with stuff. We deal with you know, historical stuff, reality stuff, stuff which is true, especially if you're playing somebody who is real, you know, somebody who actually existed. Yeah. So there is a responsibility about that. Now, there's a way of looking at somebody and saying, you know, you haven't thought about this. In fact, he was this kind of person and not the accepted kind of person that we believe. But you have to be bold about that and you have to do your homework and find that about. So it's... it's and of course, that's the delight of it, mm. is the information you get, because you're reading everything about Churchill and you're, you're building up a picture of who this man was. Yeah, you enjoy that process. I love that, that's the, that's the whole joy of doing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you prepare for someone like Hannibal Lecter then? Well, he's not really historical. <laughs> <laughs> he's more hysterical than historical. More hysterical, exactly, um, yeah. I mean, Hannibal Lecter is a very interesting part because, again, the... Oh, God. Comparisons are odious, so I mustn't go into that. So the thing about Hannibal Lecter for me is that he is completely gone. He's gone. Mm. He's, he is a man who is kind of completely... Uh, you know, he sold himself out. He sold his soul or whatever thing out because he is, he's gone. He's crazy. Yeah. And, but you can't play crazy... Yes. I mean, if you play crazy, it's kind of like obvious, you know, you know, like, anyway, I won't go into that. Uh, so what I did was, when I played Hannibal, I wanted to make him true and also scary. Yeah. Because he is true. Because he has, his sense of reality is so warped, but that's the way he lived. That's what he believed in, you know, the fact that he could slice a man and then rip out his bowel, you know, which is one of the things he did in his, you know, it, it, you go, wow, that's horrific, but that's who he was, and you know, that's what he did, you know, and the idea that he also cannibalizes as well, you know, which was, I think, made too much of in the, the other movie, but, but he is a dangerous, dangerous individual, you know, and he's also, as, as, the, as the, the character says, he is mad, he is insane. So you have to understand where he comes from. And then what, so what I did with somebody like him was I looked at a lot of films on people like Ted Bundy, for example. Well, yeah. And Ted Bundy was a rather brilliant man who had this flaw, which is this weakness about what he did to those young women. But he, was, he could have been a politician. He had a great mind, great mind. And of course, he was very plausible. And very charming. So if you see interviews with, you know, you, if you see interviews with Bundy, you, you get this impression of this character who is quite extraordinary in many ways, but deeply, deeply nasty, deeply really, you know, really dangerous. And the, the, the lens that he went to. And I find that sort of, you know, I found that one, that was my connection. And also... Uh, the other thing that got me because of this, this serial killer men mentality was when I was very young, when I was about 11, uh, there was a character in Scotland called Peter Manuel. And Peter Manuel was a, he, he was a mass murderer. He literally, he, he murdered, he, he took a taxi from Newcastle, murdered the taxi driver, went across a, a, a golf, there was a, a golf course, 
and there was a young woman who'd been in, uh, there was a party going on, he also murdered her. Then he went and he, he went and took over this family's house, the smart family, and murdered them. So this was an extraordinary, and also he conducted his own defense mm -hmm. when he came. So you see that there's a lot of very, you know, dangerous people can be also very intelligent, yeah. very intelligent. So you've got to watch them, like, you know. Mm. And that was what was so interesting about. So I, I lived with that as a child, thinking this guy, this Peter Manuel, sort of haunted me as a little boy. I remember we weren't allowed. <laughs> my, my uncle used to buy the Sunday Pictori who was staying with us. And he would hide to have, my mother hated that paper. She disapproved of it. So he would hide it under the cushions in the seat. Right. And I would get it and I would read all about Peter Manuel. So Mann. you'd see all this stuff? Yes, exactly. And you brought all that back? I brought that back. That, that came back to me because I, it, 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 it got my imagination going as a, right. at a very young age. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. OK, but let's talk about your work on projects set in the past, but not necessarily real historical figures. So King Lear, Troy, um, Titus Andronicus for the RAC. You won an Olivier Award for that. Despite the historical setting, is there more freedom because the history is just a little bit looser. It's been written by Shakespeare or someone. The, the, that's certainly true. The, the interesting thing about Titus and and the, interesting, the great thing about Shakespeare is that all his plays really relate to one another. So there's a lot of experimentation, particularly in Titus Andronicus. So you have, in Titus Andronicus, you have seeds of Hamlet, you have seeds of uh, Lear, you have seeds of Othello. Mm -hmm. uh, you have seeds of various plays, and you can see where you know, he was a young writer, because at the same time as writing, uh, writing Titus Andronis, he also wrote Richard III. Right. And so he was very fascinated by these kind of extraordinary, kind of wacky characters. And th these plays, I mean, they're, they're good plays, but then he refined his work as he got older as a playwright. But all the ideas for other plays comes in Titus Andronicus is amazing because there's so many ideas. But there's also another element in Titus Andronicus, which we discovered, is the kind of ludicrous element of it. The thing that makes it, as it was, quite funny, you know, but also black. So, for instance, for example, on the first matinee where we played at the Swan Theatre in, in, in Stratford, Eight people were carried out in the interval by the St. John's Ambulance <laughs> because it was too much for them. Wow. The play had such an extraordinary effect. And there was one point where I, I have the severed head of one of my sons and it's wrapped in a kind of uh, cheesecloth. So you see his features, but it's all bloody. And, I, and at one point I threw the head at my brother and he has to catch it like this. Unfortunately, there was somebody sitting there. He caught it and that person fainted. Oh. <laughs> So that, to me, is the power of the theatre, and I go, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've struck a chord here. Um, but how do you contemporise, if, if that's the right word, how do, you, how do you bring up to date a historical character, make it relevant for a modern audience? How do you find those bits in a script that speak to the 21st well, century? Well, I, I, I don't think we've improved very much, <laughs> quite honestly, Clive. And I really do think that uh, we are still the same. You know, it's, you know, we all, you know, our fashions change and everything, but we're still as lost as we ever were. Mm. And I mean, I, I, I have a feel, I'm not religious, but I do feel that we are, we, we don't acknowledge our own evolution. We don't acknowledge where we are as human beings, where we are in the, in the evolutionary scale. Mm. And we haven't really evolved. You know, we, we really have it. We're, we're very backward in many, many ways. We still make the same mistakes. All you have to do is look at the Ukraine, look at Israel, look at what is happening, and you say, why are we still making those mistakes? Why are we still making the same mistakes that we've continually made for centuries? So really, we haven't changed. We're still the same. The conditions have changed. The, all the structures around us have changed. But we as human beings are still as lost as we ever were. Mm. And audiences, individuals, they can, they can see that. They can recognise They can recognise it straight and away. And that's what makes it, when it touches an audience, is because uh, that member of the audience has seen something which has affected them profoundly, because they recognise. Right. They recognise who you are. So you've always got to maintain the humanity element right. of them. You right. know, that's... That's the vital thing. Because, of course, universal themes of family, politics, yeah. war, so on. All the time. They resonate. They resonate and they, they repeat themselves. Yeah. I mean, King Lear, 
Um, long day's journey in tonight. Um, Eugene O'Neill's masterpiece, which I saw on Friday, and it was absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Um, obvious parallels between those lead characters, James Tyrone, Leah, with um, some bloke called Logan Roy. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. There's a timelessness there is, to those you, characters, you, you, isn't there? Yeah, there is a timelessness. You do get a bit. I haven't read the reviews. But somebody tells me, oh, yeah, they've, they've talked a lot about Logan Ryan. You go, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> you know, just deal with the play that they're watching. Don't make it, you know, and that's where human beings are so stupid. <laughs> I mean, most critics are stupid. <laughs> they really are. Yeah. Uh, Theatre criticism has gone right down the tubes. I mean, if you think of the great Kenneth Tynan and Ronald Bryden or Harold Hobson, you think of those wonderful critics of the past. There is nobody to match them now because they don't do their homework. You know, and when you start off and notice it, oh, here's another father, and you go, oh, yeah, so obvious, so boring. You know, Logan Roy, yeah, again. It's such an obvious... It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's stupid. Why make that comparison? It's so obvious. Yeah. Yes, write it out for five minutes and then scrub it and then move on to something <laughs> else, you know. But you seem to be drawn to that kind of character. Yeah, well, well what kind of character? He's your father. I mean, how many fathers are in the room? <laughs> Probably quite... Exactly, there's one there, you know, yeah, yeah, freely. Yeah. See, everybody's true. ashamed to admit they're fathers, but this <laughs> gentleman is very happy to own up to the fact that he's a father. So, uh, you know, so fathers are fathers. Yeah, you know? but, yeah but having, having, a, having a kind of... A pretty complicated relationship with his kids. I mean, is the Logan Roy character really like most fathers? Well, he's extreme. Uh, I would say that much wrong. Oh. <laughs> and, and also, but he's also, I think, he's, to me, he's one of the most misunderstood characters I've ever played. Because people get the wrong idea about him. You know, all he's trying to do is find a successor within his own family, and they're all a bunch of wazics. They're all the, <laughs> you know, and, you know, that's the problem, you know. <laughs> you know, what do you do when you've got horrible children? You know, I mean, not many, I mean, I, I don't know how many, how many people here have horrible children, but... <laughs> that father over there, bounce have horrible children. But this is the problem, you know, I mean, I have, I have four kids, and I don't understand any of them. Now, that could be my loss, that could be my mistake, and I'm, I'm prepared to admit it, but I think, you know, you, these children are created, and it's really about the mothers, actually. It's the mothers who really have the connection. Well, no, they do, they have the real connection with their children. And fathers are kind of adjuncts. Yeah. They've, you know, they've done their job, and then they have to wait and be there and, you know, contribute as much as they can. But they don't have that, that link that, that a mother has. You know, and, and it has to be all done through behavior, you know. So it's, 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 it, and most fathers, a lot of fathers don't understand their position, you know, and I think that that's, that's the interesting thing, dramatically, which is um, what Logan, you know, and also, it's also about Logan's history. Logan had a sister who died and he possibly gave her polio. So there's, there's, there's stuff in his background, which is, kind of affecting who he is. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's the interesting of the role. You know? Yeah, and James Tyrone too. And James Tyrone. Well, James Tyrone has this one great thing that he's worked all his life. His great thing is poverty mm -hmm. and also being a product of the great hunger. Yeah. Uh, and that's something we still have not really come to terms with, is how we've affected the Irish and the Celts. We still haven't dealt with that. We've never dealt with that. Scotland is a second-class place. You know, we, we have to deal with everything through what goes on here. Uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Southern, what's going on there? But then you think of the, the, what, you know, Cromwell did in Droida. You think of what's happened to Ireland over the centuries and how it's been traduced, introduced, introduced. And even in Ireland, you know, if you talk to an Irishman now and they said, you know, there's a kind of element of depression about people. But also, there are the greatest writers, like Sheridan, like Shaw, like Oscar Wilde, that have come out of Ireland as a result of that pressure. And that's what I think is their contribution. But it's very tough in terms of, for him, and ironically, I discovered something which was really bizarre. I, <laughs> I had my DNA done a few, about two years ago, and I discovered that I'm related to a character called Nile of the Nine Hostages. Now, Niall of the Nine Hostages is a, was a, a progenitor of a lot of Irish people. 
And, uh, and it's true. <laughs> and what he did was he collected hostages, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. St. Patrick was one of his hostages, right. who he got released and sent back to Ireland, uh, to, to France. And then, stupidly, he decided to go back to Ireland to bring Christianity to them. But, and then and get rid of the snakes, apparently. But I, don't know, that, that's, I think that's one of the great myths. But so you, you, you get the sense of what went on for James O'Neill, because he came at the time, as a lot of people came to, my family came from Inniskillen in, in Northern Ireland and, and moved to Scotland, to, and it was the women. Mm. They weren't interested in the men, because the men were, they were known as kettle boilers. Uh, they were there to, well, it, it, they were there because they were farmers who no longer could farm because of what had happened in the famine. Mm. You know, and, and the famine was devastating. And we've, we've never, the, the best book about the famine is Cecil Woodham Smith's The Reason Why, which is a really a book I recommend to you. And because it tells you the horror, the real horror of that story and the genocide that was committed at that time. So the, out of that horror comes... James O'Neill and my ancestors, and James O'Neill had this thing about he was dirt poor and he wanted to make a proper, he wanted to find a life and he found his life in the theater. But the mistake he made was he fell in love. He got this money maker called the Count of Monte Cristo, which he played 5,000 times. And he played it all that. And at the end of his life, and this is on his deathbed, this is why O'Neill says he, he just, he told this, he had this speech to his son, said, this ruined my life. This stopped me from being the actor that I could have become because I sold out for the money. Yeah. I wanted, because I, I didn't know anything else. I needed that security. And of course, in the play, he's constantly accused of being mean because he's, but that's that poverty consciousness. And if you've ever experienced poverty, as I have, it never leaves you. It's like a Damoclean sword that hangs over you. And so that, is what's so powerful within the play. Mm. And also his roots, his, his mother, you know, and again, the, 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 the female, especially O'Neill's mother was an extraordinary woman. She was sort of the heroine who kept it all together because O'Neill's father uh, went back to Ireland, left the family, went back to Ireland, and actually the, he probably committed suicide. So it's a very bleak story back to you. You know, you've got a very bleak backstory there, you know. Mm. And so that contributes, and how you present yourself, you go, I'm not going to go into all that, I'm presenting myself as something different. Right. But that's still there at the root of you, you yes. know. Backstory, the past. Yeah. Mary Tyrone's character, yeah. in Long Day's Journey, she says the past is the present, yeah. isn't it? It's the future too. So that's, that's one of my. That's it's funny you should pick on that. That's my yeah. favourite lines in the play. That yeah, my wife's favourite line as well. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it, it's the fact that it isn't really history. It's it's a continuous circle or cycle of yeah. experience. We repeat and we repeat. Yeah, exactly. And we and we can't get out of it. And and and, and this is where we are again. And, and you know, we will evolve. Because that's what we are. We're, a, we're, a, we're an evolutionary species. But we haven't quite evolved nearly enough at the moment. Because yeah. we just make the same fucking stupid mistakes again and again and again, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you point to all that. Your characters trapped in the past. All characters trapped in the past. This loop of experience. Um, James Tyrone, um, he says that one of, your, one of his sons has the map of Ireland mm -hmm. written on his face, that's his heritage. He's trying to reinvent himself, but yeah. actually he cannot escape, no, you can't escape that it. past no. at all. And it's, it, it, and it's very interesting, because I, 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 I did the opposite. I tried to get away from all of that. Yeah. When I was young, you know, when I, when I came to drama school, when I, I mean, London, what, what London represents to me is freedom. Mm. Because when I was a kid, I, you know, I lived in, from Dundee, and I was at the Dundee Rep, and I had the best time. And I met this amazing woman called Kristen Linklater and went to that drama school, Lambda, and had the best time ever. But my, as I've got older, I've, I've started to acknowledge, well, where did I come from? How did I get there? I was, I've been very lucky. I've, I've been incredibly blessed, I think. I'm, I'm more blessed than most. And people, but some people can't escape that. And then you look at the levels of poverty, for instance, in my hometown, which has led to huge heroin addiction. So you're seeing 
You're seeing how those things affect you and how it troubles you and how it steers your life in certain directions. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed. I found a, you know, I found a career. Uh, but at the same time, that's still there. Mm -hmm. That sense of <coughs> poorness is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, you're, you're famous for your political views, you're noted for your political views, left of centre, socialist, SNP. How does that political um, baggage, I suppose, how does that inform your character or the well, way you approach picking a character to play? Well, no, I, I'm, I'm open. I have to keep open. I can't, I, can't, I can't base everything on my political beliefs, but that would be limiting in the extreme. Uh, not that my political, my political beliefs are my political beliefs, but I, I find that um, I have to be open mm -hmm. so that you've got to, you, you, who you are and what you're playing is not the same thing. So you have to make that effort. You have to make that commitment to the one, the one element that, that that play, that story, and that story you have to tell, and you have to tell it in the most unbiased way. So that you, 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 do, you do deal with saying, well, Brian, that's your opinion about certain things, but don't let that involve what you're doing now. You have to go on a different journey. Mm. And you have to go on the imaginative journey, you know, to allow the imagination to take hold. And uh, it, it's only in latter life that I've, I ever became political. I was never political as a kid. Mm. But then I look at the mess around me, and I think, well, I've got to make some sort of stand. And I was a big, I was a big labor man until Iraq. And then I thought that Tony Blair's behavior in Iraq was hubris beyond belief, you know, and getting, falling into, you know, with uh, Bush and, and uh, the horrible uh, Cheney and uh, Rumsfeld, you know, all of that kind of, and, 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 and he bought into that in a way that he should never have bought into. Mm. And of course, and the Middle East has been in the state of a sense. And we were, we've been directly or indirectly responsible for that. Mm. And so you begin to think, well, why do that? And I think, well, what was, you know, what, where, what have we lost? We've lost our way in some way. Mm. And it was hard, it was tough. You know, it's always tough that. Yeah. Um, the SNP, they got their first seat, I think it was uh, 1945. Um, well, the SNP was a kind of comic party yeah. to start with. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, ski and do's and socks and kilts and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I've never been a kilt person, you know, at all. No? <laughs> well, no, I like the kilt, actually. But again, this is an interesting thing about the kilt. I always thought the kilt was a Protestant thing. I never Why? thought, I didn't, Why? Well, Catholic boys never wore kilts. Oh, okay. It's very true. Catholic boys never wore kilts. It was a very Protestant thing. Of course, I've changed all that now, and it's, luckily enough, that doesn't happen. But it was a, it, it kind of marked you in a kind of way, and especially if you were a, what I call a Micmac, which you're an Irish Scot, you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> the one great thing I think about the uh, my my family moving eventually to, uh, and it's the and it's the problem about being Irish. But one great thing that we learnt about moving to Scotland is we learnt to say the word no. In Irish, there is no word for no. Right. <laughs> and you do need to say no, no. occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> that has to happen sometimes. But the, the, the sort of prominence of the SNP, particularly in the 90s, do you think that, co well, it did coincide with Rob Roy and Braveheart coming out as movies? Well, do you think they're linked? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, Rob Roy... And you were in both those films? I was in both those films. Rob Roy is in a much better script than Braveheart. Braveheart is a load of nonsense. <laughs> Uh, it really is. I mean, it's a, you know, Scots Wahé and all of that, and, and it's Mel, and he does, he, he was wonderful. Mel Gibson was wonderful on that film, and I, I and it, it won all the awards, but it's, it's, it's a load of lies. You know, he never impregnated the Prince Princess or any of that stuff. You know, so he, it's a kind of, it is a bollocks, that film. <laughs> uh, whereas Rob Roy is true, and that was written by a very good uh, Alan Sharp who wrote yeah. that, and it was a really good script because that was about the really nastier side of those ruling lords and how it worked. And no, it's, 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 it, yeah, but I, I think you're right. I think that, that you know, that, that everybody went around, you know, nobody used to put blue on their face until that film, you know. <laughs> and now we get to see people, yeah, well, and, and of course, that's because human beings are so divinely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to my uh, final question before I take um, questions from the audience and online as well. Um, what's it like living in America 
Um, you know, a, a place I lived in for many, many years, Los Angeles and, and Washington as a correspondent, um, a country that could well um, uh, have Donald Trump again as leader, uh, and a country that, um, well, one bit of it's just decided to go back to abortion laws dating from the 1860s. Well, how, how is that for you, being well, a progressive kind of guy? I, well, it's, <laughs> I think my relationship with America will be coming to a, a, a very short, sharp end quite soon because of that very thing. You see, it's very interesting about America. Uh, there's a very good book uh, called... It's written by a guy called Isaac Butler. It's called The, the Method, or How America Learned to Act. And it's about the story of the method and the story about how Stanislavski wrote what he called the system mm. of how you approach the work. And then Strasbourg took it and developed something else. And uh, there was this guy called Boris Borisevsky who was uh, Stanislavski's assistant. He was a Pole. And there was a lot of them, of course, uh, at the time in the 30s, particularly when the purges were going on, they came over and they stayed. They didn't go back. And this guy, Borisovsky, came over and he, he eventually ended up, He died. He was quite young. He was only 54 when he died. But he made this great quote. He said, the problem in America is that America is dedicated to the pursuit of individualism at the expense of community. And I think when you look at that, you really get a sense of what the problem in America is. It's so individual. Everybody has their own view. And of course, and of course some of those views are, in many ways, very, very right wing. So it's very hard to govern America. And you certainly don't need idiots like Trump doing that. You know, you, you certainly, and, I, and I do think that Byron Biden is a good man, but he's too old. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm old. I mean, I'm, he's only a few years older than me, but he, he went running. That's the problem. Don't run. That's <laughs> problem. Because it makes you look older when you get old, because the knees go and the you start go, walking yeah, around yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, so my advice to anybody who's approaching a certain age, stop running. Yeah. <laughs> Because that you'll be better off by it, but so, so you, sorry. So no, no, no. You go, no, go, go. No, no. It's just I, I, I think that that's what's so, you know, that's what's the difficulty of America. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful country in many ways, but it has no cohesion, mm. you know, and it's, it's, and it's a huge experiment because, you know, it's a federal state, a series of federal states. There's nothing else like that in the world, but it, but it hasn't got a, it hasn't got a center point to it. It's not got a, and a, and a, and a point that it can follow through on. And that's the difficulty with. So you do get these, you do get Trump. I mean, the idea that Trump even became president, I mean, even he was more surprised than anybody, but it, <laughs> but it showed you the idiocy of the American people that they actually voted for that Wazak. And you would leave? If he wins again in I, November? Well, probably. Yeah, I probably yeah. will. Yeah, you live I, in Brooklyn. I, yeah. You've been there a while. Yeah, I know. God, it's going to be so difficult to get rid of everything. And <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I think London's in a great state at the moment, particularly the theatre. I don't think the theatre's ever been better than it is at the now. There's some amazing theatre here. And I think they've really done some great work, you know, and, and, and it's great to come back and see that the work is done, you know, the motive in the queue, this England, the, the, you know, amazing play, writers like Jack Thorne, James Graham, these wonderful young writers who have come up now. Uh, the problems are always the same, but there are, we do have the writers. So that, and that, and we are always asking the questions. That's the great thing. And that's, that's the tradition of the English theatre, which happened post-war with with uh, John Osborne, look back and I know those. So that tradition of the theatre is still very strong and very active. So I love that. America doesn't have that. That's why it doesn't serve. It's very hard to create a theatre in the community because, again, this pursuit of individualism mm -hmm. at the expense of community. Sure, sure. OK, well, um, we've got a few minutes left. So we've got a roving microphone. Hands up, hands up. Come on, we want more questions. <laughs> for the brilliant Brian Cox. I think your hand went up first, actually. So we're going to see this gentleman here, just down here. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Mr. Brian Cox. Um, first, I just want to express my appreciation uh, for the opportunity. 
Um, my question specifically concerns my fascination with the dichotomy between history and information, uh, specifically how the past so readily can inform the future. Um, acknowledging your significant contributions to the dramatic arts across genres and media, um, within your experience, how important are the arts today within conveying a message, whether as an idealization or model, uh, to both current and future generations, and its role within portraying an example to both society and culture as progressing forward? I think the arts is more important than ever, because it's, it's a truth teller. Fundamentally, the arts is a truth teller. It tells the truth. It can't do anything else but do that. I, I'm talking about the performing arts, and I'm talking about the visual arts as well. Um, some of it's not very good, some of it is really good, but that's the premise of it. And for me, for me the theatre is the one true church, because it's the church of humanity. It's about, it's not about belief systems. It's about, we get, you know, the drama is how we get hooked onto belief systems and how certain belief, to, belief systems do serve us, but others don't. So you have to stay in a kind of, in a kind of pure place as an artist in order to be the, be, be the receiver of all that material and let that material come through you. Again, what I talked about, like the transmitter, that you transmit that material through, especially when, it, when the climate is really good. And the climate is particularly good at the moment here. That's why I'm back here, because I'm very... I got a taste of it last year when I, was do, I did a play in Bath, and I thought, there's something really going on here in the theatre which is good. And it, and it is truth-telling at the end of the day. And that's the most important thing. And as long as the theatre continues to do that, they still try to do that in America, but they get, they get caught up by commerce. You know, like Broadway is like a joke, you know. And, uh, and also Broadway audiences are a bit of a joke as well because they get hysterical just to be hysterical, you know. And as somebody once said, we did, I did a play <laughs> many, many years ago. It was actually a, a Eugene O'Neill play called Strange Incident, which is an even longer play than, than um, <laughs> Long Day's Journey Tonight. And the, the, the director said, we have to be, we have to be very careful, because American audiences will try and hijack the play and take it to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, because they get, oh, yeah, wonderful, and, 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 and everybody gets so excited. So there's, there's not, we have to, there has to be a certain discernment in how you approach, as, a, as an audience member, how you approach what you're watching and what you're getting from that. And, and I think good theater does that. And that's why I, I think the arts is, for me, as vital as it ever was. Sure. OK. Uh, I'm going to take the ladies here with the spectacles on. Whoa, 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 microphone. There you go. Forgive me, I'm a teacher. I, I like the sound of my own voice. Uh, may I be greedy and ask two questions? Or may I only ask one? No, no, go for it, go for it. OK, so um, my first question is, um, your favourite um, Irish actor? My favourite Irish who? Actor, actor, actress. Uh, I, oh, I'm just trying. Mary Keane. She's dead now. <laughs> she was a great Irish actress. Did you know Mary Keane? Uh, no, I thought you might say somebody like um, Michael Gambon or Daniel. Uh, you Dill. said actress. I said actor or oh, actor. Actor or well, actress. Michael is, you know, Michael is, he was born in Cabra, but then he moved very quickly. Uh, <laughs> 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 Always an Irishman, though. <laughs> uh, oh, famous Irish actor. Well, Gammon was pretty damn good, yeah. 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 Naughty as hell. Yeah. <laughs> very naughty, but, but a great actor, yeah. So, yeah, I thought you said actress, yeah. No, uh, so, um, my second question then is um, my daughter and I saw you on stage last night and we thought you were all incredible. Um, but my question really, um, I suppose, talks about the role of women, and you did uh, discuss it there. You thought that uh, women particularly were very important in, in the role they play. And I thought, so when your wife in, in the play, uh, Patricia um, Clarkson, obviously, her name is Patricia Clarkson, so is, isn't well in the play. And may I ask, so, uh, when you speak about your uh, your time growing up, you refer to your mum as she, at times she was quite unwell. Yeah. So may I, may I, may I ask you? Well, I think I think working class women, particularly, I mean, still the same. They were, you know, they were denied so much. 
in terms of how they could be and where they could be until recently when you could go to Universal and do all that. And my mother was one of many, you know, it's just one of millions of women in this country and both countries, both you know, in these islands. And she suffered accordingly because she was never allowed to express herself except through being a mother. And, uh, and at the end, because what happened to my father and certain guilt that she had about that, and it, it broke her. And it was a terrible thing to witness, to see my mum, you know, well, one time she, you know, I witnessed her trying to, <laughs> I came home one day and she was cleaning the oven. Well, that's what she said she was cleaning the oven, but there was a very strong smell of gas at the same time, which I said, I think you've left the gas on. Oh, I am not, that's stupid of me, I'm sorry. And she turned out she was fine. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think working class women had, have really, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm for the matriarchy, quite honestly. I think the patriarchy is well fucked. <laughs> and I think the women should be running the show. I, I really do believe that. I, I really do believe that. I, I'm not, not, not just saying, I mean, I just think that we've just, we've, you know, we've, we haven't got it right. And if we're going to evolve, we've just got to put it to the mothers. Because they are the ones who carry the children, so they, they really do know a kind of something much more deeper. You know, there are the odd mad women. I've, I've gone out with a few, so I know <laughs> that. But on the whole, I think it, we have to embrace the patri matriarchy, really. Sure. sure. Uh, anyone on this side? This side. There is no one on the left willing to ask a question. Oh, there's a lady there right next to you. Lovely, thank you. Um, thank you for some brilliant responses. You mentioned some of the disparity between the history you know and the creative license that's maybe taken. Do you feel a responsibility to hold your art closer to the actual history? Well, you, it's, it, 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 the history speaks for itself. Uh, the events take shape and they are a given. You can't ignore them. What is interesting is the human beings involved in that history and the variables that are there for them. And because human beings are, they don't understand themselves. We don't understand who we are. So it's, we're constantly finding out about ourselves, you know, and sometimes we get to a stagnant point where we don't move one way or the other. So that is why for me, uh, the work, you know, you have to embrace a voyage that you go on and that you take all those elements in and you cohese it to a sort of meaning for you. And you hope that the audience will take that meaning and accept that meaning, and or maybe they won't. Maybe they just say, this is nonsense, I don't want anything to do with that. That's the risk you take, but you have to, you still have to pursue your path, the path that you have towards the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, gentlemen, uh, green shirt, green shirt there with the spectacles. Yes, that's you, sir. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask why historical fiction? So what does uh, history on the stage, on the screen, bring to a discussion over history and you know, autobiograph all biographies or works of history themselves? Uh, I, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, History on the stage on the screen versus history books themselves. Why do we have fictionalized history over documentaries or biographies or the well, books the, 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 the advantage of uh, the advantage of the, uh, the, the, the 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 documentary gives you 180 degrees. The drama gives you 360 degrees. That's the difference. And that's really the fundamental difference. You know, uh, you'll get a view from, an, you'll get a great view from, I mean, some great documentaries, but it's only that view. Whereas if you are the, as the dramatic artist, you have to go into a whole different thing. You have to feed it all from that, from a 360 degree point of view. And that's the responsibility. And I think ultimately that's much more valid than 180 degrees. I mean, not that I've got anything against documentaries. I love documentaries. I make them myself, I have done. And I think they're very important. I made one about poverty. Uh, so I, I, I'm not against that. But the dramatic pulse is to do with these individuals involved in that telling of that story and what they bring to it. And that's what's exciting. And that's what makes great theatre, great television, great films. Mm. I mean, there has been a, a series on the BBC called The Nazis, um, A Warning From History. 
And in that documentary series, they've brought in a whole bunch of other people that you wouldn't normally see in a historical documentary. So psychologists, for instance, right. to try to get inside the mind of Goering or Himmler or exactly. whomever it happens to be. So um, documentaries are understanding. That's that they right. They want to make that through. And they, they embrace. Yeah, yeah exactly. Which, which is great. OK, another question. Uh, young lady down here. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering what you thought about the sort of cost-benefit analysis of historical fiction. As a Scottish Gaelic speaker, the fact that Outlanders made my language really popular is great, but as a history teacher, the fact that the Stir Battle of Stirling Bridge in Braveheart has no bridge does my head in. So where is the cost-benefit analysis of doing historical fiction, and when, does it, well, when, does the, when are the lies worth it, basically? Say that again. When are the lies worth it, basically? The lies? Yeah. It, it depends. Uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> the Battle of Stirling Bridge without the Battle of Stirling, without the Stirling Bridge. Uh, I, I don't know. I think that I, I, I think it, it's not so much lies as just sort of elaborating on something, you know, bringing something forward and making it kind of to find, you know, because if you just talked about the, about the bridge and you go, well, you know, that's pretty boring, actually, really. So you have to really understand what else is going on, particularly at that time with Wallace and the whole situation, you know. So I, I don't think, I don't see that we are telling lies. I don't think we ever tell lies. Uh, that would be, and we don't, I mean, we don't, we try not to obfuscate the truth. I mean, I certainly don't when I'm working. If something didn't happen, I'll just say, why have you put that in? It's not true. You know, we'll let I mean, I can work with the truth. I can't work with a series of postulant lies, you know. Yeah. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Uh, lady over there with a the hat on. Microphone coming to you. Yep. Great, thank you. Hello, thank you for talking with us today. Um, I'm from America, and everything you say is correct, number one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank but I'm also involved in um, amateur theater there, and building a theater community is something that we're really uh, desperate to do um, for all the reasons that you elaborate. Do you have any insight as to what's the best way to go about that Just at the amateur it. level? Just do it. You have to do it. You have to battle and do it and follow what you, what you believe and what you feel is important. I mean, I think it's great that you've got this amateur theatre, and it's great that, you're, that, that, that is trying to contribute something to the com community. And all I can say is put it on, get it done, do it. No question. OK, and one final question here at the front. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Hi, Brian. Um, <clears throat> Stanislavski, Lee Strasberg, you don't seem to have much time for the so-called method. Stella, I have a lot of time for Stanislavski. Stella I have Adler. no time for Street Lee Strasberg. Stella Adler, are you adding... Stella Adler, I have a lot of time for. In terms of rejection, the ups and downs, the poverty that you can experience if you become an actor, would you recommend it to anybody? <laughs> recommend what? Becoming an actor. Yeah, it's a good life. <laughs> it's a tough life. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a... What is it? Uh, you know, it's like a vacation rather than a job. And... Uh, you know, you have to ride it. It's like riding a bucking bronc. And sometimes the bronc can really buck, you know, as I've discovered in my career. But it's, it, 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 you've just got to know how to keep going, you know. Um, it's interesting when you raise this thing. I, I'll just tell you this story, which, again, is in this book. <coughs> One of the great divides between when the Russians came and Stanislavski came, and they all loved what he was doing, particularly Strasbourg people, but there was this thing called... Uh, he called it effective memory, and it was a lesson that he 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 used where ch that you go back to your childhood and you remember a traumatic event. And now Stanislavs used to get, I mean, uh, Strasbourg used to get off on this. He loved it. Stella Adler was very wary of this. She felt that there was uh, this was something misleading. It was going up an avenue, so she took herself off to Paris. Because uh, uh, Stanislavski used to, uh, was allowed to spend his summers in Paris, and he lived in the Bois de Boulogne, so she went to see him in the Bois de Boulogne. And because they were always keen about this effective memory, or as Strasbourg called it, emotional memory. And uh, she, she asked the, the great man, she said, so what do you think 
uh, Maestro, about the idea of um, effective memory. Uh, we were struggling with it. He said, oh, I got rid of that years ago. <laughs> and, and, she, and he went, what? She said, well, I got rid of that years ago. And she said, why? She said, because it interferes with the imagination. Mm. And that's the most important thing, is the imagination. That's what makes us unique, is that we have this thing called imagination. And that's what feeds us. That's why we can't go wrong. That lady who was the young lady who was talking to me earlier on about, uh, I can't remember, she's somewhere here. Uh, that's what's important. Yeah, that's what's important is the imagination is given that freedom to, to work. And if, the, if you're trying to emote something, it's not based on anything. It's not based on how you imagine or how you see something. It's based on feeling. But feeling has to come from thought. Feeling doesn't come, you know, feeling comes from how you deal with something. How you feel, how you think about something makes you feel something, you know. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> um, I've just got one final question. What's written on your socks? <laughs> My socks say fuck positively. <laughs> and actually, it's a mistake. I put on the wrong socks today. I didn't mean to put them on. But I had to grab them very quickly. Oh, uh, OK. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Cox. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone that's attended the festival over the weekend. A really, a really big thank you to everyone at the British Library, especially Jonah, who's been working tirelessly. A massive thank you to um, my team here, Izzy, Sarah, and Shafi, wherever he's gone, and also our BSL interpreters, who've been fantastic as well. If I've forgotten anyone, I'm sorry. 